Are communists outside the class? This is from the ICT website. The conflict is between class and class, not party in party, because in the end, the dialectical revolutionary force is the class and not the party. The party sensitizes and strengthens and gives conscience, conscious guidance to revolutionary action. In this sense, the party is part of the class within the class, not outside the class and distinct from it. The dialectical overturning is realized by the class as a whole, not by the party in place of the class, but there would be no transition from class in itself to class for itself in the case of the absence of the nerve center of preparation and guidance, which is the party. That was a quotation from Honorado Damon. Introductory note. In this article, we are focusing on an issue which is fundamental for us, the issue of the relationship between party and class. We will do this by quoting long passages from two old pieces written and produced by Honorado Damon and Mauro Stefanini Jr. These are a text by Damon Spontaneity and the Role of Personality and Class Consciousness from Theory to Political Intervention by Stefanini from the 1970s. Both works, not surprisingly, have as their starting point what is to be done by Lenin. This text is in fact, in many respects, an important theoretical reference point. In it, Lenin, following the line of dialectical and historical materialism, clearly emphasizes the limits within which the spontaneous class struggle is inevitably expressed and indicates the party's action as an indispensable contribution in order for the class to go beyond simple, purely trade unionist consciousness, a term used by Lenin, and develop a revolutionary consciousness. Um, it must be recognized that what is to be done made a significant significant contribution on the theoretical question of the relationship that must exist between communists and the working class. Acknowledging that does not mean, however, accepting this document as myth or model. It was written in 1902, when not even in Russia was there an organized communist party. In addition, the language used is affected to a great extent as Honorado Demon himself emphasized by the bitter but correct polemic Lenin was conducting against the economist and populist current. So while recognizing the value of Lenin's revolutionary text, some political aspects need exploring and clarifying. This is the sense we have to say in which the two articles mentioned above operate. We have therefore decided to revisit some passages as the material is very useful for reflections on this issue. We begin by reporting the observations of Honorado Damon. Honorado Damon's clarifications. To clarify the distinction between party and class as moments of the same process, we should recall the well-known reference to Kotsky in the thought of Lenin a reference which, in the epoch of what is to be done, found its justification in the bitter controversy waged against the economist and spontaneist tendency. Kotsky denied that socialist consciousness would be the necessary direct result of the proletarian class struggle and stated that socialism and the class struggle arise side by side and not one from the other. They arise from different premises. Modern socialist consciousness can arise only on the basis of profound scientific knowledge. In fact, contemporary economic science is, like modern technique, a condition of socialist production and the proletariat. However, much it may want it can create neither the one nor the other. Science and technology both arise from the contemporary social process. The vehicle of science is not the proletariat, but bourgeois intellectuals. And even contemporary socialism was born in the brain of members of this class and has been communicated by them to those proletarians elevated by their intellectual development, who subsequently introduce it within the class struggle of the proletariat where conditions permit. 
Socialist consciousness is therefore an item imported into the class struggle of the proletariat from outside and not something that arises spontaneously. And Lenin emphasizes, the history of all countries attests that the, that the working class by its own forces alone is only able to elaborate a trade unionist consciousness, namely the conviction of the need to join trade unions to conduct the struggle against the bosses, to demand from the government this or that law required by workers, and so on. The doctrine of socialism arose from the philosophical, historical, and economic theories, which were elaborated by educated representatives of the property classes, the intellectuals. From the point of view of social position, the founders of modern scientific socialism, Marx and Engels, were bourgeois intellectuals. Even in Russia, the theoretical doctrine of social democracy arose altogether independently of the spontaneous growth of the labor movement. It arose as a natural and inevitable result of the development of thought among revolutionary socialist intellectuals. As can be seen, the issue was posed in a very stark and one-sided way, as befits polemi polemical language. But as always, a polemical truth is only partial and does not exclude, does not deny, indeed poses the need for a more general subsequent truth. We would be making a serious mistake if we reduce the issue to the rigid, rigid distinction between those who have not yet developed consciousness of the goal and are only able to develop a trade unionist consciousness, and those, the intellectuals of the bourgeoisie, through being holders of science and technology, are the bearers of socialist consciousness. We would end up falling into a basically dualistic scholastic evaluation, far from a dialectical view of the problem. It is important to emphasize this initial clarification from Damon. It is true indeed that dialectical and historical materialism as the Marxist critique of political economy are theoretical tools <laughs> thanks to the activity of intellectuals of bourgeois extraction. This does not mean, however, that today only the intellectuals of middle class background can make use of this method of analysis in order to then develop a revolutionary consciousness in a phase of profound bourgeois ideological domination. The communist vanguard must in fact be formed by the proletariat, but also by the bourgeois ab abandoning the interests of their class of origin, putting themselves at the service of the proletarian revolution. It must be said that the Bolshevik party before 1917 grew with militants of proletarian extraction and this applies to all communist parties formed in that historical period. The conclusion remains true that revolutionary consciousness is not achieved simply under the pressure of the demand struggles of the class, dictated by the material conditions experienced, but thanks to the acquisition of a revolutionary analytical tool, to be precise, Marxism. Let us return to the text of Damon, in particular to the passage where the focus is placed on the historical genesis of revolutionary theory, which did not arise as an automatic result of the class struggle, but of course is intertwined with it. Socialism and the class struggle, although arising from different premises, however, are the result of the interweaving of two necessary moments of a single process, that of class development. And more clearly, science and technology arise from the social process. It is true, but there would be no social process if it were not for human forces, and if they, in turn, did not adhere intimately in their action to the process itself, and under the thrust of different interests, did not give rise to situations of conflict and struggle. It is in this environment that was born and has developed a sense of differentiation between the various social groups which would go on to crystallize in class antagonisms. In a word, alongside the nexus of things is intertwined the nexus of human events. Socialism is not born from the discovery of a formula, even a superb one. It is not the result of laboratory investigations. It is not only science, but also a new way to address the problem of life, a new vision of the world born of the development of modern capitalism and gradually matured under the goad of its own contradictions. If socialism is the goal toward which the dialectic of the economic organization of capitalism itself tends, 
It is also the goal to which men have turned in their irrepressible expectation of equality and freedom. Even if we considered the contribution of Marx and Engels as the work of scholars from the bourgeoisie, we would have posed a problem of extreme banality if we failed to historically situate their exposure and destructive criticism of the capitalist system under consideration. And to historically situate it means to feel the critical work of these teachers not only in terms of science, but as that of men who participated as protagonists in the historical process, where they considered as their own the cause of that class in whose fate potentially exists the future destiny of all mankind. They are the men who conducted the harshest polemic against conservative conformity and saw in the historical development of capitalism the raison d'etre of the historical development of the proletariat. They are the systematizers of class doctrine, the theorists of revolutionary subversion as a natural outcome of the continuously elevated struggle between the two fundamental classes of modern history. The writer of Capital is also the writer of the Communist Manifesto and the address of the First Workers International. They are inseparable. It is ultimately a matter of defectors from the bourgeoisie who have ceased to think and act according to the canons of bourgeois culture, but who think and act in the same way as those who are subject to alienated labor, with a perspective for the construction of a socialist society in which work is no longer a burden to humanity, but the free expression of individual personality. In this respect, and the problem does not support a different hypothesis, Marx, Engels, and Lenin, and eventually with them and after them, an army of thinkers, politicians, and intellectuals connected with Marxism, all had the task of introducing within the proletariat the consciousness of its situation and mission. But the formative elements of this matrix have their historical consciousness in the working class. They are reflected from time to time in the brain of some men, as in a laboratory scientific systematization, to return them to the class to help it and make this conscious of consciousness of purpose even more clear and distinct. So let's look at Stefanini's text, from which the passages that compose the following paragraphs in our work will be taken. The controversy over what is to be done. Plekhanov in the working class and social democratic intellectuals seems to straighten out some excesses of Lenin's what is to be done. Among the criticized passages would be one according to which in Russia, the theoretical doctrine of social democracy arose altogether independently of the spontaneous growth of the labor movement. It arose as a natural and inevitable result of thought amongst revolutionary socialist intellectuals. To this Plekhanov says, the spontaneous growth of the labor movement exerted on it, the revolutionary movement, a very strong influence just when the old populist theory began to disintegrate under the pressure of new demands of life that it had not predicted. In the revolutionary journalism of the late 70s, one can find some very instructive examples of the fact that the unexpected appearance on our historical scene of the proletariat with all the factors that are peculiar to it embarrassed the populist authors and thus came the time for the great revision of the populist program. And later, Marx and Engels recognized in the proletariat the main revolutionary force of our time, a force whose historic mission is to replace the capitalist mode of production with the socialist. But that they might recognize this force in this proletariat required two conditions. First of all, the antagonism of classes and the rapid spontaneous growth of the labor movement Secondly, on their own part, i.e. on the part of those who were called to put socialism on a scientific basis, a careful examination of these phenomena. In the clash between quotes, Plekhanov seems to come out victorious. Lenin went too far. If the crux of what is to be done is to be found in that same sentence by Lenin and targeted by his rival, those who refuse Leninism and the essential concepts about the Leninist party in toto would be right. These concepts were based in fact on a wrong methodological premise, but it is not. The key to reading what is to be done cannot at all be the comfortable version which Plekhanov provided, and as we shall see, so did Martinov and the Mensheviks and so forth. And it was Plekhanov himself who said this to Martinov during the second Congress of the RSDLP, 
um, in 1903, where the very ideas of, of what is to be done were the center of discussion. Here is his statement. Lenin has not written a treatise on the philosophy of history, but rather a polemic against economists who said we have to wait and see what will come from the working class itself without the help of the revolutionary baculus. The latter were forbidden to say any word to the workers regarding the revolutionary baculus, in other words, regarding a theoretical consciousness. But if one deletes the baculus, there remains only an unconscious mass into which consciousness must be inserted from the outside. If one wants to be fair to Lenin and had carefully read his book, one would have seen that he says just that. So speaking about the union struggle, the fight for demands, he develops the same idea that the broad socialist consciousness can be inserted only from beyond the limits of the immediate struggle for the improvement of the conditions of sale of the labor power. So Plekhanov in 1903 provides us with the best response to his anti-Lenin writings in 1904. But it is interesting to trace the subsequent contortions of Plekhanov that help us to better understand the essence of the problem. He writes, precisely in 1904, a false polemic with Lenin. Instinctive socialism should, according to Kotsky, lead to social revolution, and, and continues, quoting the German, where it explains the basis of his work, Die Social Revolution. I wanted to know what consequences arise necessarily in the political domain of the proletariat due to its class interests and the needs of production. Quite apart from the theoretical base on which it was deemed the proletariat would stand during its victory, I then deleted any hypothesis on the influence of socialist ideas on the proletariat. Listen hard, listen, is a phrase of Plekhanov aimed at Leninists. At the beginning of my research, I am asked the question, what use will the proletariat have to make of its own power? Not what is desired according to a particular theory or to a certain state of mind, but what should it undertake motivated by its class interests and the strength of economic necessity? The full quote made by Plekhanov himself shows two things. A. Kotsky examined in his book, highly esteemed by Lenin himself, the social revolution, the necessary economic and political measures which gave the revolution a communist character that alone makes it a social revolution. In this sense, the abstraction that Kotsky makes of the party and the conditions of class consciousness is not only perfectly legitimate, but scientifically necessary, as it is necessary to abstract from the, from the particular experimental conditions, specifically changed several times in the laboratory, to arrive at the scientifically correct definition of any law. For example, thermodynamics. The equation for the state of gas, PV equals RNT, Fermi teaches us, applies regardless of whether any real gas obeys the equation of thermodynamics. Oh, hold on. Any equation exactly, sorry. One calls a substance that obeys the equation exactly a perfect or ideal gas. The laws of thermodynamics tell us what are the ideal conditions for the gas which would verify the exact equation. But in order to continue in the exposition of the principles of this discipline, it is necessary to abstract from concrete reality test cases to be able to state laws that allow us to get back to them with the wealth of knowledge necessary to make progress in the same production technique. Thermal machines, calculations regarding height, air temperature, physical solutions, etc. Whenever one resorts to convoluted politics to escape strict Marxist positions, the scientific character that sets them apart is forgotten. Plekhanov is simply shooting himself in the foot. In fact, B. Plekhanov's quotation of Kotsky does not prove what he wanted to prove. Kotsky insists that necessity drives the proletariat who, willingly or otherwise, will have to deal with what arises from economic necessity. But even abstracting from the real conditions of consciousness, he leaves open the question for a moment how instinctive socialism must lead to social revolution. That's exactly what Lenin answers in What is to be Done, which Plekhanov accepted at the Second Congress of the RSDLP, as we have already seen. <clears throat> in What is to be Done is the clear answer to the problem we can formulate thus. 
given that the theoretical consciousness of socialism is the product of theorizing outside of the daily dynamics of the class, from which it actually emerges as a problem or political issue, how is the link between the one and the other made? At the second Congress of the RSDLP, 14 months after the release of the book in session 9, Martinov said, Comrade Karskij said that my conception of the relationship of the working class and socialist ideology boils down to the argument that the working class alone comes to develop the theory of scientific socialism. I never said anything like that. I only found that the various layers of the proletariat have independently developed forms of economic and political class struggle and have transformed the ideas of bourgeois socialism into communist ideas. That, among other things, is exactly why Karskij, Karskij had reprimanded him. This particularly smells of opportunism from a mile away, since various layers of the proletariat somehow come to communism. However, even the ideologues are dealt with. He says, the function of the ideologues consisted in having synthesized these elements of the class struggle, and having given a theoretical foundation to this struggle. This work was realized, not by workers, but by Marx and Engels, and consisted in the transformation of past philosophical and scientific theories into the theory of scientific socialism. Therefore, proceeding with the proper method of systematic abstractions, one, there are no external ideologues. In this case, do the layers of the proletariat still transform the ideas of bourgeois socialism into communist ideas? From the second part of the quote, one would say not. Two, the form changes, but the problem remains the same. Without a theoretical foundation for the class struggle, is the transformation of bourgeois ideas into communist ones by workers in struggle still possible? Martinov still says no. In conclusion, Martinov, like Plekhanov, skirts around the issue without getting to its root, much less the solution. For Lenin, when he was about to write what is to be done, the dialectical relationship that binds the life of the class with its political doctrine was clear. His error was to have possibly taken this for granted, and that he had only set about a work entirely devoted to the critique of the tailist wing of social democracy at the time, pointing out, pointing out and refuting the errors of this particular wing. First Conclusions the implicit premises are fully in line with the above mentioned intervention at the Second Congress by Plekhanov and with the teachings of Kotsky in Social Revolution, in addition to the traditional purely Marxist approaches to the problem. They are as follows. The objective existence of the class and its struggle against the capitalists provide on the one hand the objective prerequisites for the scientific elaboration of communist doctrine and its program. On the other hand, we have the concrete cultural terrain of the class instinct of the proletariat itself, which can extend to an indistinct desire for the subversion of society. On the basis of existence, Plekhanov's life, of the proletarian, communist thinking develops in the form of critical instruments, political and organizational principles for the implement implementation of the program. Marx indeed developed the fundamental thesis on the dictatorship of the proletariat on the basis of the experience of the Parisian proletariat, but that argument would not be, mu would not be such without a Marx, the protagonist of doctrinal elaboration. Lenin himself began and left unfinished a thesis on the Soviet form of power, the power of councils, on the basis of the Russian experience of 1905 and even more in the storm of February 1917. But what, would be, but what would be the result of the success of struggles without Lenin's April Theses and without the immediate work of the Bolshevik party based on them? The external factor to the class, which we will review in depth later, is thus a product of the spontaneous motion of the class in the sense that it provides the raw material of experience and data that it elaborates into a doctrine a program so as to return it in this form to the real proletarian movement. The need for an external factor is given by the same historical context dominated by the collision, the clash between classes, since there's no social reality that cannot find its political expression. The party as instrument. Based on the conclusions above, Stefanini in polemics with the ICC 
highlights some aspects concerning the functions of the class party. Below is a summary of these observations. The party is the political instrument of class struggle. It is not simply an accelerator, a catalyst of the process of the uptake of revolutionary consciousness by the working class. If we were to reduce the role of the party to that of a simple accelerator, we would be saying that consciousness is already all within the class itself, and it only remains to accelerate its growth. If we were to say that the party is only a catalyst, we would be arguing that it is not essential. According to this erroneous assertion, in fact, we would come to affirm that without a party, the class can, however, to transform society in a socialist sense. The party at most simply reduces the time scale of this process. The, instru the instruments of the class. The proletariat does not fail at times of rising class struggle to create the appropriate tools to this end. Indeed, it is the workers themselves who give themselves an instrument when they organize in the strike committee, coordinations of struggle, resistance centers, etc. The actual movement of the class, the workers' concrete relations to the situations which they live, is configured materially in the proletariat special organizations, each of which has clearly defined purposes and definite limits. In the conduct of the strike, it is a common practice, though not always the case, that workers create appropriate tools, such as committees of struggle. These are exhausted with the completion of the struggle and disappear with it, or are reabsorbed by the normal trade union organizations. The Russian proletariat in 1905, at the height of its struggle against the Tsarist autocracy and against the capitalists that bound it to the appalling conditions of poverty, made history in the first formation of the Soviets. Trotsky describes it thus. The Councils of Workers' Deputies was established to respond to an objective requirement aroused by the situation at the time. It was necessary to have an organization equipped with indisputable authority, free from any tradition, immediately bringing together the dispersed and unconnected multitudes. This organization was to be the point of convergence of all revolutionary currents within the proletariat and had to be capable of initiative and control automatically. The key element was to be able to set it up in 24 hours. So the class has provided and will provide the suitable organs to fight first for the proletarian assault and then the exercise of power. But on the basis of that body created by the class, the Bolshevik party drew up the line that it rapidly refined week by week between February and April of 1917, culminating in the theses of Lenin to secure victory in October. 1905 was the historic lab laboratory in which the class demonstrated evidence of its experience and its revolutionary tension. The Bolshevik party was the conscious creation and the active moment of the link between instinct and consciousness, between the thrust from below and the historic program of communism. <clears throat> the external element. Undoubtedly, the Bolshevik party was already in existence. 1905 was not its origin. Equally, undoubtedly, since 1905, it has created new theoretical, political, and organizational elements. How to combine the two facts? Once again, it comes to going back to the essential point of the communist doctrine, according to which there is a profound difference between class instinct and class consciousness. One is born and develops within the workers' struggle as part of the proletariat's own heritage, as it is brought into being by the antagonism of material interests and feeds the growing economic, social, and political contradictions arising from the same antagonism. In summary, therefore, the relations between workers and capitalists are sufficient to lead to a certain generalization of workers' struggles and a certain intensity of the clashes. The other consciousness is born from the scientific examination of class contradictions, increases with the increase of knowledge of the contradictions, lives and feeds on the examination and processing of the data emanating from the historical experiences of the class. Now, although possible, the transition from classic or class instinct to class consciousness is not automatic, 
nor is additional radicalization of the clashes or the plurality of negative experiences sufficient in this regard. The major episode of class struggle in Italy serves to prove this, the occupation of the factories in 1920. From Mir Mirafiori telegrams were, were sent to the Union and the Italian Socialist Party calling for the launch of revolutionary action. The instinct of the class was largely oriented towards the revolution and many other factors were present. Weapons and plans for arming workers were in place. The petty bourgeoisie was uncertain and on the verge of siding with the proletariat if its initiative proceeded. The armed forces of the bourgeoisie were sufficiently disoriented. What was missing, however, and it could not arise from the factories, was the force that could speedily transform the revolutionary material into organizational and military policies for the victory of the proletariat. There were people and forces in the PSI able to take on this role, but they were not yet ready. They were not yet an external element, neither to the class nor the PSI. The abstentionist fraction, the majority of those that converged at Livorno in the PCDI, had not had time to do that work in the class that would have led to the convergence of the instinct of the class and the scientific consciousness of its political exponents on a revolutionary terrain. Consciousness is therefore exactly an element imported into the proletarian class struggle where conditions allow it. Mauro, Mauro Stefanini concludes this paragraph in his own words, examining an aspect already already dealt with by Honorato Damon, the historical genesis of revolutionary theory. Are the dominant ideas the ideas of the ruling class or not? Is it true or, or not true that the controllers of the means of material production thereby at the same time control the means of intellectual production, and that the proletariat is rather an exploited class and therefore ideologically dominated? If so, then it is also true that contemporary socialism was born in the brain of these layers bourgeois intellectuals, and was communicated by them to the proletarians elevated by their intellectual development, who later introduced it in the class struggle of the proletariat, still Kotsky and Lenin. This is a given, regardless of the fact that the language used herein is hardly dialectical. Let us therefore turn to the second part of the dialectical relationship. The dialectical relationship. The intellectuals, the theoreticians of the class, do not work on the basis of fantasy or on the basis of abstract principles unconnected with the reality of the proletariat. We say that the intellectuals remain the intellectuals as always, that is, tied to their socioeconomic matrix, if they do not insert themselves into the class, if they do not become a formative element bringing, it, bringing a contribution to the class. The intellectual becomes the intellectual worker who has no has to work in and for the class. Another way to illustrate the same concept, consciousness is a reflection on, on the terrain of ideas of the bourgeois proletarian antagonism. So it is the subjective element that allows the overcoming of the contradiction by the revolutionary destruction of capitalism. The real clash of interests between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the practical experience of the class is the sine qua non of consciousness in each step of its progression. When theory, philosophy, morality, etc. come into conflict with the existing relations, this can only happen due to the fact that existing social relations have come into contradiction with the existing forces or exi existing productive forces. It is not the task of the revolutionary organization, the party, to elaborate doctrines outside of the real movement of the class and its actual historical experiences. It is therefore only by living within the class phenomenon that the party can draw up the lines of its political action. We therefore reject the argument that the identity between the proletariat and socialism lies in the fact that the theory is a mechanical product of the class. The argument that consciousness might be a pure product of the spirit of exalted characters should also be rejected. Here is the false problem. Does socialist consciousness come from the class or from those who know how to reflect the laws of history? It is a false problem because it is not posed in dialectical terms. That is in a way that really allows social and historical reality to be understood. 
The, so the solution is in fact outside of the alternative terms in which it is formulated and includes them both. Socialist consciousness is the scientific reflection on the experiences of the class and the problems that arise from this, conducted by those who are equipped for this discussion and identify themselves politically with the class. This identification is the dialectical relationship between theoretical consciousness of socialism and the material existence of the proletariat and its movement. The resulting political problems. Let us therefore return to the thread that binds the class to its party. If consciousness is presented in its most complete form as a body of theory in the program for communism, how is the concrete connection between these and the class whose existence gave rise to them expressed? The class fights its demand struggles, clashes with capital to varying degrees, with its laws, its compatibility, maturing in those fights, its generic anti-capitalist orientation, its class instinct. This happens if and when other obstacles do not hamper the growth of the said struggles. Under these simple conditions, however, it is relatively easy for capital to divert the masses toward partial solutions or objectives of fake renewal. To do this, it uses certain, certain of its forces, um, ones better able to perform those mystifying functions. Alongside their action to stifle and lead through the use of an appropriate demagoguery towards a reformist goal, albeit chimer chimerical, is entrusted the task of dispersing the first wave after which the state follows through with directly repressive initiatives. This is what has always occurred in the absence of a revolutionary party adequately prepared for the task and rooted in the class. This is what will still happen if revolutionaries are unable to organize in time. The clandestine forces of capital are already deployed inside the class, even when the latter is taking a severe beating with little response. The resumption of the struggle then is certainly accompanied by falling by failing confidence in the forces of traditional social democracy, which is made possible since those forces directly accept, access the arena of power as the real material agents of anti-labor attacks. This does not necessarily coincide with the orientation of the class in the or organically revolutionary sense that is, towards the political and doctrinal platform for communism. But this special orientation does not come from heaven, but from the reinsertion of revolutionary science within struggles by the party that elaborates and proposes it.